I work and study in the field of social entrepreneurship. Social enterprise is a hybrid form of business uh, organizing where the goal is not simply the attainment of wealth, but measurable improvements in society as a whole. Parallel to my work, I've been on a personal journey of sorts, learning more about my own family history. And that's actually where I would like to start with you this evening. I am an heir to an entrepreneurial dynasty that began shortly after the Civil War in the United States. What is remarkable about this legacy is that my great-grandfather, Morris Marable, was born a slave. One of the many terrible realities of American slavery is that being sold was a common occurrence. Most slaves were sold at least once in their lifetime, sometimes twice, with devastating impacts on cultural and familial ties. Morris was 11 years old when he was sold, and he never saw his mother again. He was sold to a man from Alabama called Marable. Now, years later, in the dying hours of the Civil War, with the Union Army pushing south towards Atlanta, Morris found himself on the rebel, that's Confederate side, with his young master, Marable. Now, I won't attempt to re-prosecute the very um, contested history of blacks in the Confederacy, only to say that as a slave, it is very unlikely that Morris had any choice in the matter. Where he did at the end of that battle, however, which was effectively the end of the war, Morris did have a choice. He could have left his severely wounded master on the blood-soaked ground at West Point, Georgia, and fallen in behind the victorious Union Army, but he did not. Rather, he took him back home to Alabama before taking his leave as a free man. Morris lived to experience a brief but important period of American history called Reconstruction. During this period, some blacks were able to achieve a measure of political and economic success. Brilliant, hardworking, and frugal, Morris excelled, buying a cotton gin and a timber mill. He voted in this period, owned property, and became a respected member of his community. After his first wife tragically died, Morris took a second wife who would become my great-grandmother. Warner Culbertson was a Native American woman, a descendant of the mighty Creek Muscogee Nation. The Creek Muscogee are the indigenous peoples of the southeastern part of the United States. They were dispossessed of those lands, their passage west called the Trail of Tears. A small number, however, did stay, sometimes intermarrying with freed blacks. By the time my grandfather Manning came along, the promise of reconstruction was well and truly over. Knights of the KKK, respectable civic and business leaders by day, rode by night. A terrifying and torturous death by hanging was an occupational hazard for black entrepreneurs. We believe that 90% of those who met their end in that way were business owners. Lynching was a form of economic terrorism meant to remind blacks that even if they were no longer property, they would never be allowed to threaten the economic superiority of white people. My research into the history of black entrepreneurship in American history has crystallized for me what was really at the heart of this particular form of terrorism, as well as its modern manifestations today. You see, the entire racist colonial project is built on two things. The subjugation and enslavement of black labor and the theft of indigenous lands. So what could a man or woman of color do to most provoke the ire of the white colonialist, colonialist order? You guessed it. Employ himself or herself and own land. And yet that is precisely what Morris Marable did. It's also what Manning did. Manning, like a lot of entre entrepreneurs, he had a job for a time. He worked on the a and Railroad as a laborer. He was said to have declared on one cold night with his family gathered around him, I don't care if I got to scratch around in the yard like one of them chickens, I ain't gonna never go back to work for another white man ever again. And true to his word, he did not. 
He took his place in a dynasty that was continued by his sons. The Marable family enterprises employed black people. They contributed financially to black churches and black community organizations. They supported black candidates for political office, and they lived in the communities where they worked, even after it was no longer fashionable for middle-class blacks to live in black communities. We often think of the tactics of the civil rights movement, the marches, the protests, the sit-ins. Have you ever thought about the costs? Who supported the organizations that paid to bail people out of jail, that paid the wages for the leaders, that chartered the buses, that bought the food? That money came from the black community itself. And entrepreneurial black families like mine were the backbone of the movement precisely because they were not reliant on white people for their livelihood. And this fact emboldened them politically. I don't think that it's a coincidence that one of the pivotal school integration cases of the civil rights movement occurred in my hometown, Tuskegee, Alabama. That's also where the Marable brothers operated their timber milling, construction, engineer, and engineering, and other businesses. Here's what I want you to think about. In spite of all the structural barriers and racism they continue to face today, African Americans are consistently more optimistic than whites about their business environment, more self-confident about their business skills, and exhibit higher alertness to new business opportunities. Black youth exhibit a stronger desire to start businesses and are more likely to believe that successful entrepreneurs have a responsibility to give back to society. I should say at this point that the matter of black entrepreneurship is not without its critics. My first cousin is the late Professor Manning Marable, named for our grandfather. As a young black man attending university, he was radicalized by the philosophies of Marx. He devoured works such as the myth of Negro capitalism and how capitalism underdeveloped Africa, the latter inspiring him to write his important book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America. I deeply respect Manning's scholarly legacy and even though I never had the opportunity to meet him in person, he inspired me to become a sociologist. But I've chosen a different course. Rather than resting my hopes in a socialist revolution for black liberation, I choose to embrace the complexities of minority entrepreneurship itself as a form of resistance and a means to our equality. As I mentioned at the start, I support a special breed of entrepreneurs called social entrepreneurs. Now, not all social entrepreneurs are racial minorities, but our research indicates that they are more likely to come from diverse backgrounds, and I think I understand why. Social entrepreneurs are men and women who see a, some, some gap in some aspect of our social, cultural, economic, or environmental landscape. And they say, even though it looks impossible, I'm gonna have a go at addressing that. But rather than only using charity, they carefully design interventions that balance purpose with trade. There's a growing body of academic work that's trying to explain what's happening in the minds of social entrepreneurs. And several studies talk about fantasy, or technically phantasmic attachment to pro-social organizational forms. This unshakable belief or commitment to social purpose is thought to neutralize the fears and anxieties associated with trying to balance the realities of commercial business. Very simply, it's all a fantasy. It's an illusion of an improbable reality. It's a dream. My people know a thing or two about dreams. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously had a dream and so did my Uncle James, or Jake as he was called. Jake was a Tuskegee Airman during World War II, and he talked about how in long nights on deployment, he would dream about his father's wish for all of his sons. He wanted a life for them where they didn't have to work for anybody, and they owned the land under their feet. What about the critics, though? What about those who say that trying to beat the white man at his own game is futile? Now often you will hear them use a quote, one that I believe has been terribly misunderstood. Black feminist activist and scholar Audre Lorde wrote, 
the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Now, many have taken that to mean that we cannot use capitalism to address the disadvantage that the masters have used capitalism to perpetuate. However, there is an assumption there that is implicitly incorrect. White people didn't create entrepreneurship. I am the descendant of African and Native American peoples who have planted, harvested, traded, created currencies, and other innovative financial instruments that have, success, that have successfully sustained communities for millennia. Our cultures, food, music, our labor has been appropriated and commoditized for the benefit of white people for a comparatively short period of time. That does not mean that the tools themselves are irretrievably broken. And I don't think that Lord was saying that we shouldn't try. Every time an entrepreneur has a go at trying to use business to do more than just business, to intervene in the lives of people in a measurably meaningful way, she is reappropriating the master's tools for good. I wish to submit to you today that if we are genuinely committed to social justice, racial equality, and reconciliation with First Nations people, we have to encourage and equip the dreamers in their efforts to change the world, no matter how crazy it seems. In doing so, we will achieve the entrepreneurial dreams of our forefathers.